brutal murders, drug trafficking, racketeering, constant armed conflicts. All of this is directly connected to the infamous Russian Mafia. Today, I'll tell you how Russians became the foremost figures in the criminal world of America in just a few decades, who led the organization, and how the government fears the Russian Mafia. And in the end, you'll learn about how Pablo Escobar collaborated with Tomvoskia OPG. Enjoy watching! Imagine a wonderful neighborhood in a thriving American city, located just 300 feet from the ocean. An excellent coastline with everything needed for a good time. A wonderful beach with beautiful girls, warm ocean water. Can you picture it? Nice. It would seem like the best neighborhood in the city if it weren't for one but. I'm talking about the infamous Brighton Beach, located in New York. What's so terrible about this area, you might ask? Well, I'll answer. The Russian Mafia. In the first half of the 1970s, America, so to speak, opened its doors to immigrants from the USSR. Now, political immigrants could enter the country. Naturally, in the Soviet Union, they decided that it was pointless to send their scientists and other useful people to the West. It would be much better to send criminals and thieves across the ocean so that they wouldn't be trouble back home. Specifically for these people, the government and law enforcement agencies of the USSR prepared clean documents with no records of criminal activity. A stream of lawless offenders flooded into America. So the previously thrice convicted thief Yvesi Agron ended up in the USA. Quite a few people had already fled from the USSR even before the law was enacted. And by some twist of fate, they all ended up in the Brighton Beach area. Agron went there as well. Naturally, the Russian criminal didn't want to work as a laborer or cleaner for peanuts, so he quickly formed his own gang in America. In 1977, this criminal group engaged in extorting money from entrepreneurs. It's worth noting how they did it. At the time, everyone talked about the cruelty of the new Russian gang. Even the Italian Camorra, a highly developed criminal organization, noted how easily the new neighbors killed anyone who displeased them. If you owned a store in those times and Russians came to you, there was only one way out. Give them money. Otherwise, you would be killed. For this reason, literally no entrepreneur turned to the police out of the fear of death. There was even one illustrative case. In 1980, a woman who had witnessed multiple attacks identified a member of the Russian gang. However, she couldn't physically and psychologically testify in court. The bandits dealt with the poor woman with particular cruelty. They gouged out her eyes, tortured her for a long time, and ultimately killed her. They didn't spare her little son either. I also found information that other groups such as the Italian Mafia helped the Russian Mafia wreak havoc in America. Back in the 80s, the criminals began collaborating with the Colombo clan. This is one of the five Italian-American gangster families. Thanks to this collaboration, the groups earned hundreds of millions of dollars annually. How is that even possible? They engaged in tax maneuvers related to gasoline trade. Naturally, this business was very profitable. However, there was a significant catch. The mastermind behind this scheme was Agron's closest advisor, David Bogatain, and he conducted all his maneuvers secretly from the boss. Naturally, over time, Yevsi Agron found out everything. After all, such enormous sums couldn't just go unnoticed. And when he heard that his closest subordinate was doing something behind his back, he flew into rage. Agron immediately tried to get a share in his highly profitable business. However, this led to assassination attempts on the life of the first Russian Mafia boss. No one wanted to share money with him. The first attempt to kill the leader of the Russians was made in 1984. Agron managed to survive the attack, but he was wounded into the neck and face. However, the following year, the boss's life came to an end. When he left his apartment, a hitman was already waiting for him near the elevator. Agron had no chance, as he received two bullets to the head and died on the spot. The strangest thing was that his bodyguard was absent that day. By the way, I also found interesting information about the first boss of the Russian Mafia. It was with the participation of Yevsi Agron that the second Russian newspaper in the USA was released. This ordinary immigrant from the streets of the USSR turned into the head of a very cruel mafia that everyone had to reckon with literally. In 1979, Vladimir Vysotsky personally approached Agron, trying to resolve his financial issue with the organizers. You're probably eager to hear what happened next. So, after the death of Yevzi Agron, Marat Balogula took over the organization's helm. He was an immigrant from Odessa who settled in the Brighton Beach area in 1977. Before leading the Russian Mafia, Marat had achieved certain heights. He became a co-owner of some of the first Russian restaurants in America, Sadko and Odessa. By the way, the latter was managed for a long time by the quite famous Russian-American poet Willy Tokarev. 
Just three years after opening in 1980, Balagula sold the Sadco restaurant. With the proceeds, he opened a gas station and eventually got into wholesale fuel sales. Here, he reached immense heights by evading taxes. According to the information I found while preparing for the video, the criminal gasoline trade cost the American Treasury billions of dollars. Now, an important clarification. Marat Balagula specifically controlled all the trade in illegal gasoline in certain areas of New York. Over 500 people worked for him at the facilities. So, the pure profit from such schemes amounts to hundreds of millions of dollars. Considering that the amount of the entire market of such fuel was controlled by Soviet immigrants, one can conclude that at the time, the Russian Mafia was at the top of the criminal world in America. But the music didn't play for long. In 1985, he was arrested. And what do you think he was arrested for? You'd be shocked! But it certainly wasn't for trading illegal fuel. He landed in the police station for credit card fraud. By the way, this was far from Balagula's priority business, and Marat's role was not the most important. In 1986, the jury found him guilty. However, the Russian boss, without waiting for the execution of the sentence, was temporarily released on bail of half a million dollars. At the same time, he fled the country. He managed to hide for over two years, but in 1989, he was finally caught in Frankfurt and expedited to the USA. Once back in America, he was sentenced to eight years for the credit card case, and later, another ten years were added to the term. As a result, Murad lost control long ago, when he was first arrested. The second boss of the Russian Mafia literally raised the criminal group to the skies. He continued to address matters with great cruelty, but now the gang's fear of influence had significantly expanded. Russians were anywhere there were any significant amounts of money. By the way, I found another interesting story. During Balagula's time, a conflict arose between him and another gangster, Vladimir Rensky. Vladimir also assembled his gang and decided not to mess around. He stormed into the Odessa club owned by Murat, approached him, and stuck a gun in his mouth. His demands were quite simple. Half a million dollars in cash now, and a percentage of all profits. But what Resnick didn't know was that Balagula closely collaborated with the Italians. When they learned that an attack had been made on Murat, they simply shot the audacious gangster right in the middle of the street. But what happened that night at Odessa gave the leader of the Russian Mafia a heart attack. He was just too scared. The vacant post of the head of the Russian Mafia after Murat's arrest had to be filled by someone competent. Boris Nayfield, nicknamed Biba, was perfect for the role. He immigrated from Belarus in the late 1970s. Oh, and by the way, he was the bodyguard of the first leader of the Russian Mafia, Yevsi Agron. But before that, he was involved only in petty crime. After Yevsi's death, Biba started working for Murat. He was literally always close to the leaders of the Russian Mafia. Naturally, this gave him excellent experience in conducting business at the highest level. Therefore, after Murat's arrest, Boris took over as the head. I won't prolong it, and I'll tell you right away the most interesting facts about Biba's rule. After he took hold of the entire power of the criminal organization, he began building a new business. He didn't want to continue working with illegal fuel. Instead, Boris decided to trade drugs. Biba, along with the Italian-Polish gangster Riccardo Fancini, conducted a quite successful operation smuggling heavy narcotics from Thailand to the USA. And how all this happened will shock you. Hmm. Firstly, the cargo from Thailand was delivered to Singapore. There, the drugs were hidden in the cathode ray tubes of televisions, after which they were sent to Poland through a freight company located in Belgium. From there, the cargo was flown to New York, and as soon as Biba and his co-founder received the heavy narcotics, they immediately sold parts of the five families about which I've already partly told you. The rest was decided to be distributed through the street gangsters of Latin America. And the amount of Russian mafias earned at the time can shock anyone. Billions of dollars were involved in this business. With the proceeds, Biba bought himself a luxurious apartment in the Belgian city of Antwerp and a huge house in New York right across from the reserve. Boris led a splendid life on the loose. He constantly entertained with his mistress, went to restaurants, but still didn't forget to manage all the process within the Mafia. In January of 1994, Biba was arrested for drug trafficking. After some time, Boris and his associates pleaded guilty, but they showed no remorse for their criminal life. Later on, Biba agreed to cooperate with the FBI. He provided law enforcement with a lot of crucial information, which resulted in him being sentenced to only five years in prison. In 1999, he was released. Biba didn't stop engaging in criminal activities, however. How long do you think he managed to stay free? Well, I'll tell you. He was arrested only back in 2008 for cigarette smuggling. 
For this crime, he again received a five-year sentence and was released in 2014. But his freedom didn't last too long this time. Less than two years later, Boris was arrested for extortion. As it turned out, he had been contracted to kill someone for $100,000. But wanting more, he offered the victim a chance to save his life for $125,000. Naturally, considering such threats, the man who was supposed to kill him turned to the police. For this, Biba received his final sentence. As it seems to me, the former leader of the Russian Mafia in America has become pitiful. Right now, Boris lives on social assistance and asks the US authorities to return him to his homeland. He avoids places where he was once a king so that no one recognizes him. The once famous and very ruthless Biba has softened to the point of considering participating in reality shows to earn money. Do you think such behavior from the head of the Russian Mafia is normal? Write about it down in the comments. What you are about to hear may shock you. The Russian Mafia collaborated with the notorious Medellin cartel led by Pablo Escobar himself. Along with the Tambov organized crime group, the Colombians intended to buy the Russian diesel submarine Foxtrot. The plan was that after the torpedo tubes were removed from the submarine, it could accommodate 40 tons of narcotics. The estimated cost of the deal was $20 million. However, after some time and a lot of negotiations, the mobsters managed to bring the price down to $5 million. Some key figures involved in the deal died, preventing the sale of the submarine. Nevertheless, information about it still leaked to the media, which embellished the situation. The narco sub became a true legend worldwide. Many conspiracy theories circulated around this deal. Some claimed that the deal did happen. Journalists asserted that criminals planned to bombard the coasts of America with torpedoes filled with cocaine. And some said that the submarine was intended for Pablo Escobar himself to escape from the pursuit of American intelligence agencies. But all this was just talk and fiction. In reality, the submarine was simply not sold. Right now, it cannot be said that the Russian Mafia is a unified organization. I'll tell you this, it's a huge criminal network with numerous different gangs that interact with each other and with other criminal entities. Americans themselves called these gangs the Russian Mafia. But in reality, there is no ruler of this criminal organization. According to the FBI, there are currently 6,000 gangs operating in the USA. They are roughly organized into 200 syndicates. Only a few stand out among them though. For example, the Brotherhood Circle. In 2011, US President Barack Obama named this organization one of the main threats to America's national security. Today, Russian groups operate underground. They have abandoned excessive violence as was the case in the 70s and 80s. Now their efforts are concentrated on financial manipulations. According to various data, they currently earn trillions of dollars. These figures simply amaze me. But most importantly, the Russian Mafia still remains the leader of the criminal world in the USA. Today, you've learned even more about the famous Russian Mafia. Thanks for watching.